let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for being with us today. I'm Cliff Lynch. I'm the director of the Coalition for Networked Information, and uh, I will be introducing this session. This session is one of a very small number of plenary sessions, which is part of the second day of the um, plenary days of the CNI Fall 2020 member meeting, which is taking place virtually. A uh, couple of mechanical things. We are recording the session. It will be available after the session. We do have closed captioning available. Please turn that on if it's helpful. Um, there is a chat box and you're welcome to use that uh, throughout the session. There's also a Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can use that to pose questions for the presenters at any point during the presentation. We'll address all the questions that have come in at the end of the session when um, Diane Goldenberg Hart from CNI will moderate a Q&A session. Let me just very briefly introduce this topic. Um, so Ithaca SNR has been doing a whole series of important interrelated studies um, around the academic research enterprise, around the services that support research, around the role of the chief research officer in various kinds of institutions. Um, they've done it through analysis, they've done it through interviews, um, and uh, it's very rich work in an area that I think is largely underexamined and um, really a bit misunderstood by many people um, outside of the, um, well, inside and outside of the research enterprise, actually. Um, some of the roles and activities in here are quite a mystery to many people. And I think that um, library leadership, for example, while they have certainly realized that effective relationships and working together, um, uh, with the um, chief research officer and uh, their, um, their team is essential, um, don't necessarily fully understand that role and what it does. So I thought that this, and the same thing, by the way, uh, should be said of CIOs at many of our institutions. So I thought that it would be very worthwhile for us to hear in a plenary session in some depth from the team at SNR, or at least some of the team that's been working on this uh, over the past months. I have to say, I've followed this work particularly closely, both because of our interest in research support um, and uh, what that comprises and how it's delivered, but also because of the work we've done on research continuity and resilience um, uh, through our executive roundtables. So um, uh, I think you'll find this extremely informative. And with that, I'd like to welcome uh, Jane Radecki Oya Rieger and Roger Schoenfeld, all of whom I think are pretty well known to our community and thank them for joining us to uh, fill us in on all this work. And I'm gonna turn it over to Roger who will start off the uh, discussion. Thank you so much, Clifford. Uh, thank you for the invitation to present this, this work today. Um, but maybe most importantly, thank you to CNI for recognizing and foreseeing the importance of work on the research enterprise this year. 
Um, Clifford, the, the executive roundtable that you mentioned for, for folks who haven't had a chance to read the notes from that, it's a, it's a very, very, the report from that, it's a very, very important piece of work. And um, the efforts around continuity are ones that we've, um, we've really benefited from in being members of the, of this and participants in the CNI community this, this, this year. Um, and it's just one, one example of the kind of continued um, importance that I think a lot of us have found from, from the CNI community this year. So, uh, so just a, a, re a real recognition for, uh, for that. Um, Jane and Oya will uh, be speaking in just a moment. Um, and, um, and, and so, uh, so I, I don't wanna hold things up, but I do want to start with just a, um, a, a working definition of the research enterprise. Um, we're, what we're really talking about here are the systems, the services, the staffing that, um, that of the work of the university to generate knowledge. And, um, and a lot of that in practice has to do with supporting scientific research. And so you will hear a real emphasis on that in a lot of our discussions uh, today. Our presentation is drawn, uh, as Clifford was mentioning, from a number of projects we've worked on, but um, principally from, from two. So in the next slide, I'll, I'll um, mention one of them, which is the Senior Research Officer Project. We just published this earlier this month, and this was a project that Oya and I worked on um, most closely in which we interviewed 44 senior research officers, the vice presidents and vice provosts for research um, across some of the largest and most research intensive universities in the US. Um, and then the other project uh, is, is one that Jane really led, Jane and I worked on, um, which, which looked at the impacts of COVID on the research enterprise. Um, large scale landscape review of everything that we could find that, um, that, that spoke to those impacts. And we're gonna weave together some of the findings um, and analysis from both of these projects. We really tried to separate in the reports, here's what we know about the impacts of COVID versus here are some of the larger kind of strategic and organizational directions. But in this presentation, we're gonna try to blend, blend those two together because of course, both of those are, are incredibly important. So, um, so I will just uh, say a word or two about the presentation as we'll give it. I'm gonna just offer a couple of words about the senior research officer. Um, then uh, the role itself, Jane will talk about the financial framework, and then Oya will talk about some of the uh, important findings that came out of our conversations with the senior research officers, external funding, research support, research data, research analytics. Um, and then I'll, I'll uh, close with some, some observations about compliance and, and human impacts. Uh, we expect to have plenty of time for questions and discussion, so please, please get, um, get thinking about, about those already. Um, so this, the role of the senior research officer, this will be very familiar to, to, to some, but maybe a little bit less familiar to others. Um, in, in the next slide, what I'll show is that, is that this is a big job. Um, it's, it's one that has been increasingly centralized across uh, at, at the university level in recent years, so that today at most universities, the role has a unitary scope in the sense that there is a single senior research officer for the university as a whole. This has been the product of a number of reorganizations um, in, in, in the universities um, in terms of staffing and reporting and so forth. Um, it's also the result uh, increasingly of an interest in systems integration so that uh, data don't have to be rekeyed and, and, and so forth um, so that services can be provided centrally. This role oversees hundreds and up to more than a thousand employees at the universities, at many of the universities that we, that we profiled. Um, this, is a, um, uh, this is an academic and administrative role. So it is, uh, a, it's an academic and administrative role, leadership role. Um, so it includes, um, it includes everything from compliance and research safety, research support services and enablement, fundraising and other forms of revenue generation, and also a variety at some institutions, a variety of interdisciplinary academic centers that are part of, of this role. Um, it has, the role has different titles. Um, so we can see in some institutions that, um, that it's, a, it's a vice president, sometimes it's a vice provost, sometimes it reports to the president or chancellor, sometimes it reports to the provost. Typically, 
these roles are um, dotted lined to some degree across both of those two organizations. But when it reports to the president, when it has a vice president title, it's more likely to have other kinds of responsibilities, whether it's innovation, government relations, communications, et cetera. And then finally, we developed, uh, we kind of assessed that there were two different models for these roles. All of the incumbents are highly successful scientists or administrators, typically. Some of them are following more of a professional model where they've been the department chair, then they were the dean of, the dean of, of a school, now they're the vice provost, and one day they might like to be the provost or the president of an institution. Uh, in other cases, they are following much more of a, of a service model where they will be um, taking a three-year term or a five-year term, let's say, um, as a faculty member, often continuing to run a lab of their own and really seeing themselves representing the voice of the faculty into the research administration apparatus. So there's, some, there's as many differences as there are similarities um, underneath this term senior research officer. From here, I'm now gonna turn things over to Jane, who's going to really kind of connect the human piece into the financial <clears throat> in which this role and its work uh, should be understood. Great, thanks, Roger. Um, oh yeah, if you could go to the next slide, please. Great. So first, before we dive into discussion, it's really important to take a look at university revenue streams and universities' dependencies on certain types of revenue as everything that we talk about today can be affected by this financial framework. So as you'll see from this chart, there are really just a few main revenue streams for US higher education. And as many of us know, several revenue sources for research universities have been and are being negatively affected by the pandemic. First, revenue from hospitals and healthcare providers has taken a significant hit due to the cancellation of elective procedures that we saw in the spring. For large research universities that have medical schools and hospital systems under the purview of the university system, the revenue losses in the spring grew rapidly. What the pandemic has shown very clearly is that hospitals have the ability to be a substantial drain on the universities that own them. Second, we all witnessed as enrollments for the fall 2020 semester dropped and thereby tuition and fees or the largest stream of revenue for colleges and universities decreased. What's interesting about this revenue stream is that historically in an economic downturn or recession, enrollment at colleges and universities actually increases, but this has not been the case during the pandemic. We have especially seen enrollment of international students decrease, which is troublesome for some universities in terms of revenue because notoriously these students pay more or in most cases pay full price for tuition. Additionally, more financial aid has been needed by students than in many years past. Finally, there was a significant amount of refunds on auxiliary fees, which are things like um, room and board, meal plans, parking passes, and, and so on, all of which are part of what make up this other category from the graph on this slide. All of these refunds took place in the spring of 2020, and the financial impacts on institutions from the loss of auxiliary revenue was and is material for many. These millions of dollars in refunds left holes in universities operating revenue budgets, and decreased housing and other auxiliary revenue has topped the list of factors that influenced the 2021 fiscal year budget for many institutions. So clearly, while many different sources of revenue have declined, externally funded research, which is this green grant circle that you're now seeing on the chart, has remained a strong revenue source with no immediate risks to its continuation. On top of this, external federal agencies have seemed to be relatively financially stable as well. 
Next slide, please. One of the risks that universities had to be extremely cognizant about is that in most cases, universities do not make money from externally funded scientific research, but rather in fact, this research is very much seen as a loss for universities as they have to funnel money into these projects. The unfunded costs of research are then subsidized through university schools, departments, and, and other contributions, um, thereby spending funds that are coming from negatively impacted revenue streams. As we all know, research experienced an unprecedented halt due to COVID. These temporary closures of research labs at universities not only impacted research progress, but it also had the effect of adding some undue pressures around the research office and indirect costs that needed to come in and be spent. So on average, around a third of most federal grants are allocated towards indirect costs. And a portion of these indirect costs end up going towards the research office where they're spent. This money that comes into the research office from indirect costs from externally funded grants, um, most times scientific grants, uh, goes, goes towards ensuring the needs of the current research portfolio, but also to its aspirations. It also helps fund um, needed compliance measures, proposal development, administrative costs, and, and so on. So even when labs were shut down for a period of time in the spring and summer, direct expenses such as travel and equipment or materials for a project were unspent, but there very well may have been a corresponding slowdown in the recognition of indirect costs from these projects in the research office. At the same time, many institutions and universities still had many expenses to pay for that are normally covered by said indirect costs, um, such as research support services. While, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, externally funded research revenue has thus far been relatively stable, there has been substantial risks to scientific research support and capital expenditure due to the inability to cross-subsidize what would be uh, considered a normal amount of capital from instruction and healthcare. Um, these budgetary risks to research support are really important to consider, especially when it comes to research cores, as research cores are probably one of the most enabling shared services that senior research officers worry about. Most importantly, why this is of such concern is due to the fact that research cores enable capital investments at a level that would be impossible within a single externally funded research project or a single research lab. Finally, as we know from the recent library survey on library directors that SNR published last week, most research libraries are receiving budget cuts. It also became clear from interviews with senior research officers that even though revenues from research activities are steady and in many cases growing, some institutions are fully expecting potentially devastating budget cuts to the research office. Next slide, please. So as we all know, scientific research was significantly impacted by the rapid shutdown of all non-essential and non-COVID-19 related research. Thousands of research were, researchers were left scrambling, trying to figure out what to do to preserve their work. With research halted, it was assumed that the salaries for researchers would also be suspended. However, several White House Office of Management and Budget memos came out that um, ended up authorizing a few short-term exceptions to the guidelines in how federal research dollars could be spent. With personnel costs normally being the largest share of any federal grant, institutions and researchers were allowed to continue to draw salaries from their grants 
even when their labs were shut down. There were also other allowances put in place. Essentially, the goal of these policies was to attempt to preserve as much of the US research enterprise as possible in the face of unprecedented disruptions. However, it's to be noted that these funding flexibilities um, were not extended indefinitely, which in many cases may have led universities to begin reopening their labs sooner than they would have liked as federal agencies such as the NSF and the NIH could no longer continue to pay researchers salaries with no research actually taking place. In many ways, this meant that externally funded research activity and the continued need for capital had a really powerful and significant influence in shaping university activity and policies surrounding institutions allowing labs to reopen and researchers to return back to work physically on campus. So with this financial framework in mind, I am now gonna turn it over to Oya to discuss findings from the senior research officers report more in depth. Uh, good afternoon. It's always a great pleasure and an honor to join the CNI uh, forum. So uh, our interviews with 44 senior research officers from the US took place in the thick of the pandemic. So as you can imagine, the individuals we talked with were getting ready to start an unprecedented semester. However, they seemed to welcome when we asked them to tell us about their directions, challenges and priorities beyond the intense stage they were going through. So we would like to share um, some of our key findings, uh, starting with funding. Well, what excites uh, senior research officer is, by all means, the vision of creating knowledge, educating future researchers, uh, getting the innovation out there. But to accomplish these goals, revenue is an extremely important goal. As uh, one of the interviewees said, research has turned into a multi-hundred million dollar source of revenue. They implement a range of strategies to maintain and uh, further develop the university's revenue base and uh, business model. Uh, many of the research officers have funding related performance goals. The metrics used uh, include the number and dollar value of uh, proposals submitted or funded the percentage and distribution of uh, scholars that submit proposals, for instance, uh, beyond the STEM fields, as many uh, universities are interested in uh, multidisciplinary work. Also, external competition related to peer institutions could be a part of the metrics too. Well, uh, it's more efficient to implement a large grant than a small one. So with increasing focus on taking on grand challenges, interdisciplinary large scale projects are gaining more and more importance. Such projects not only require people skills uh, in brokering partnerships, but also an effective and efficient service structure to support uh, the proposal development and implementation processes. Clearly, the research configuration is evolving. However, many universities continue to rely on distributed legacy support structures um, at the college and sometimes even at the department level. So trying to develop common and central services is indeed a big task. Uh, several interviewees told us that they need to avoid over-reliance on the federal government. Corporate and philanthropic partnerships are increasingly essential, uh, not only to diversify sources, but also to fund priority areas uh, outside federal agencies. For instance, climate change or um, stem cell research. Uh, there were multiple incentives for working with companies. For instance, 
engaging in collaborative research, uh, possible funds and scholarships, and also very importantly, creating internships and career tracks for graduates. The interviews stressed uh, the significance of translating research and innovations into products within the state, especially at uh, public institutions. Contributing to the local economy is important uh, in generating public awareness and uh, political support for research activities. Uh, research support. Uh, one of our questions during the interviews was, how are the services that support research, such as shared facilities, research computing, and the library uh, are evolving in your institution? Uh, well, research support, uh, when we say research support, the most important research support services um, across virtually every conversation we had was the research course. Jane also referred to the research course, so let me just offer a very quick uh, definition. Uh, these facilities are centralized, shared resources. Uh, they provide access to instruments, technologies, uh, testing, and related services. And very importantly, they provide expert uh, technical and consultancy services. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, you know, the PIs and researchers, they can focus on their own areas of expertise and rely on uh, knowledge and assistance from research course staff. Uh, and these facilities rely on cutting edge instruments and uh, require significant capital, in capital investments. Research cores are important to be competitive. Uh, although these units often report up to the senior research officer, uh, their business approaches vary and uh, involve complex configurations of funds, staffing, and organizational models. Well, uh, uh, you know, you, you probably have noticed that uh, as we were, uh, as we were uh, uh, asking about research support, we especially listed the library as one of the service providers. Uh, however, the library was seldom mentioned uh, as the interviewees described us their research support configuration, priorities, and challenges. When we probed and asked them specifically, several mentioned that the library was evolving. Sometimes uh, they made references to indicate their awareness of uh, budgetary pressures, especially uh, with electronic resources. They seem to be aware. Uh, research data, let, let me share some findings related to research data. Well, uh, it's clear from many interview, interviewees that data services were largely a distributed and often actually uncoordinated function within the university. Uh, these officers really do not feel that there's a blueprint for how to do so. And uh, they feel that none of their peers have figured it out yet either. There was a sense that treating public access as only a mandate was limiting. Instead, uh, researchers needed to be helped to see public access uh, as part of the university's responsibility to make the products of research more accessible and shareable. When we were talking about data in general, uh, or specifically about research data, uh, we, we really noticed that they are mindful of uh, many socio-technical issues such as security, privacy, confidentiality, research ethics, uh, quality of data, reliability of data, so on and so forth. These issues are very important for them, perhaps even more important than openness. Software uh, that support 
research data gathering and analysis, uh, such as lab notebooks and survey platforms, did not seem to rise to their attention. Many of them were uh, familiar with electronic laboratory notebooks as a category, but uh, it did not seem to be at their level. They were mindful of disciplinary differences, and uh, some really were uh, skeptical of their broad use and value given the uh, disciplinary differences. Uh, let's actually say a few words about the library's role as uh, the topic entered our discussions while we were discussing research data. There were certainly some references to the library within the context of research data and workflow tools. For instance, uh, some of the officers uh, either have tested or were getting ready to test digital lab notebooks in their university, their offices or their universities. And uh, several interviewees were familiar with the library's role in creating uh, research data management plans. Uh, actually, you know, one sentiment uh, I would, I think represented by uh, one comment was that implementing research data management plans was easier said than done. Uh, and uh, a couple of interviewees actually referred to the aspirational nature of the library taking the leadership in research data stewardship. They were really mindful and they were making these remarks, especially given the broad range of skills and resources needed and what is already available and uh, the distributed expertise within their universities. Research analytics. Uh, so one of our questions involved uh, research analytics and uh, which is actually a quick definition, uh, the curation, aggregation, and utilization of information about research activities and outputs, uh, publications, data sets, patents, grants, academic service and honors, just, just to name a few. Well, uh, several interviewees were skeptical about the continuing role and importance of traditional metrics. They seem to be much more interested in assessing impact, uh, such as innovations translated into uh, products, uh, jobs created, and lives saved. They are mindful of disciplinary differences. Some feel that uh, research analytics systems often fail in incorporating uh, contextual or institutional uh, practices and values. Uh, we, you know, we also asked them if they have a research information management system, how it is working. Uh, although they are generally familiar with research information systems, such systems, uh, the material is not engaged with them. In some cases, the program is delegated to a subsidiary office, uh, or in some cases, the program is, uh, or in some cases, actually, they understand the importance of data-driven decision-making and the role uh, research analytics can play, but uh, they don't feel that they have access to the required information and analysis to support their purposes. When it comes to managing research information, there were really a handful of success stories. Uh, one of the impediments seems to be the distributed nature of responsibilities. Again, we kept on running into this actually, distributed nature. And also challenges in assigning responsibilities and coordinating efforts in such an autonomous environment. Many expressed uh, a considerable level of dissatisfaction with their institutional uh, research information management systems. Actually, this is another occasion when the library was mentioned as running uh, the university's uh, RIM system. And uh, actually, the system was mainly perceived as an externally facing communication tool rather than an information management uh, mechanism system in support of their work. I think 
at this point, uh, I'm going to turn over to um, Roger to continue with findings from the SNEER Research Officer study. So now we come to the boring part, compliance. Um, in fact, uh, in fact, this was not a boring topic at all uh, in the conversations with the senior research officers. This was one of the themes that came up um, most frequently with, with them in discussing their strategic priorities. So if we can go on to the next um, slide. It, what, was, what was quite clear was that when they say compliance, there's of course many things that they're talking about, many issues that they oversee. But easily the most um, uh, important of these in terms of new areas that's really come up as a strategic priority um, are the issues of foreign influence and research security. Um, and uh, for, for those who may not know, CNI is currently running a series of executive roundtables on research nationalism and some of the issues related to this. So um, there will be a report out shortly on, on that, which I think will be um, terribly informative for, for all of us on, on, on these topics. But what we heard from the senior research officers was a widespread view that although often um, there's a discussion about foreign influence or research security, um, often the regulatory target of, of, of that today is China. Um, there, we did hear some mentions of Iran and Russia as well. Some of the specific issues that came up from the senior research officer perspective in these areas is uh, disclosure of foreign research funding and some concerns about whether those disclosures are, um, are adequate given the regulatory scrutiny of those, um, as well as issues around uh, flows of international graduate students. There have been, as some of you may know, um, some, some concerns about the um, about the, 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 the kind of um, sourcing and interest of, of certain sets of, of graduate students. Um, this area has been uh, occupying huge bandwidth for the senior research officers. They've worked to understand the issues because there have in fact not been, um, you know, there's a combination of new regulation, but also newly enforced existing regulation. And I think just trying to understand what the issues are has been uh, uh, preoccupation. There have been efforts to establish the processes, the organizational structures, and the staffing. By the way, there is now dedicated staffing at many institutions to try to ensure and manage compliance with, um, with some of these issues. And of course, there's been an effort to educate faculty members and make sure that faculty members understand what their responsibilities and potential risks in some of these areas may be. Um, if we can go on to the next slide, one of the things that was really, really clear is that within this emphasis on compliance, there are also some real concerns that the senior research officers have. Probably the one that came up most regularly was a concern about limitations in talent acquisitions and research competitiveness, um, where there were concerns about whether they would still be able to uh, acquire talent internationally to the same degree that had been possible previously, um, and the implications that that could have on research competitiveness. There were concerns about scientific collaborations with uh, universities and individual researchers and research labs in other countries. Um, and there were concerns, you know, frankly, about the basic principles of scientific openness and the free exchange of ideas. All that said, we heard a variety of different views about the nature of this emphasis on compliance. We heard some individuals who felt very, very strongly that this was a reflection, that this, this um, uh, the issue of foreign influence and research security really was a reflection of, uh, of research nationalism and even xenophobia in the, in the outgoing administration in the US. Um, then we heard others who said, well, I'm read in on a classified basis and I can tell you that at least some of these concerns are very legitimate. So we heard a really wide range and everything between, uh, between those, those two extremes. I would like to um, emphasize that the concerns here, some of them are, are, are about competitiveness and so forth, but some of them are actual, some of the concerns we heard from the senior research officers are real human concerns about the effects on individuals. And so I'd like to close, we'd like to close by talking about some of the human impacts that the, um, not just from research security, but, but also from the pandemic itself on the research enterprise. 
Um, and so in the next slide, what you'll see is that the human impacts of COVID on researchers that, um, that we were able to see in our landscape re re review are, are vast. I'm sure this is not a surprise to anyone, but it would be remiss not to emphasize um, the limitations uh, facing international students, graduate students in this case is what we were focusing on because of, uh, because of the research enterprise and the impediments that they face in, um, in, in coming to and staying in the United States during, especially during the pandemic, but there were other, um, certainly other issues connected to that as well. We, it was also very clear that there are differential impacts from the pandemic and the associated disruptions. Um, these impacts are inequitable by gender, they're inequitable by caregiver status, they're inequitable by career level. Um, and, and this really comes into, um, you know, in, into how the research enterprise is staffed and the researchers themselves, how they are, um, uh, how their career progression and professional development will, will take uh, place. And so just to kind of recap, we saw that there were substantial unanswered questions in these areas about international talent flows. And so here you can see that the pandemic uh, and these issues around research security are probably compounding on one another in some, in some deleterious ways. Um, there's substantial unanswered questions about the development of early career researchers um, and some of the challenges that, that they may face from some of these disruptions. And although it was clear that there are likely setbacks in achieving gender equity in the academic science enterprise, um, there of course are substantial unanswered questions about exactly what, what those will look like and whether there are ways to ameliorate that. So with that, we would like to uh, bring the presentation to a close. Um, we've certainly covered a tremendous amount of ground here, and we would love to uh, hear what resonated and what, what questions there, there may be where we can perhaps dig in a little bit further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roger, and thank you, Oya and Jane, for just a fantastic presentation and overview of this landscape, which is uh, rich and fascinating and um, really just leads us to so many more questions about where we're headed and what more we need to be addressing and asking and uh, thinking about. I really appreciate you setting the scene for that. Um, as Roger said, the floor is now open for questions. So please uh, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box now. And our panelists would be happy to address them. Uh, I know that Cliff has a question so while we're waiting um, to hear from other attendees, Cliff, do you want to go ahead? I, yes, I do, and it's it's a little bit long-winded, but um, I'll I'll ask it anyway. So particularly when we started looking into research continuity kinds of issues in uh, the March-April time frame, there was a um, sense that we got at a number of institutions that senior leadership seem to roughly equate um, the research enterprise with the stuff we do in the labs here, um, which I found very interesting. Um, I'm thinking a little bit about your definition of the research enterprise, and it seems like there are a couple ways you could go at it. One is a purely is this sort of, well, it's what we do in our labs. Um, another way is to look at it as it's anything we can get extramural funding for. Um, uh, and the, you know, sort of financial frame um, uh, lends a little credence to that. Um, or you can use the, the sort of more general definition that uh, I believe Roger opened with about, you know, it's, it's about the generation of knowledge. Um, how do, how, in your conversations, how did, how did things like humanities factor in um, to uh, the thinking of chief research officers? And um, maybe as, as one additional sort of sub footnote to that, I find your distinction between 
professional and service um, uh, um, um, approaches to the chief research officer position, extremely illuminating and fruitful. Um, I'm in my limited experience here, um, when you look at people who are doing this in the service role, they almost, I cannot think of, a, of an example that doesn't come out of some kind of STEM field. I'm wondering if you ran across any chief research officers uh, in a service role who came out of the humanities. Roger, do you want to start? Sure. Perhaps I'll I'll jump in, and um, and Oya or Jane can uh, as uh, as as is useful. I, I think that I, I would just say, in terms of the definition, I would start by saying, in terms of the definition of the research enterprise, I think it would vary tremendously um, based on which senior research officer we spoke with. So we spoke with some who. Um, you know, who really see themselves principally as chief revenue officers for the for the research enterprise. And for those, I don't think that the humanities do meaningfully factor in, except insofar as in a few cases, they really were looking at how could we generate more revenue for the humanities? That was that was kind of the a, a discussion topic that at least one of them, maybe two, really prominently um, we're, we're trying to emphasize and they were saying, look, it's not that we're expecting the humanists to generate millions of dollars each, but if we go from, you know, an average of $5,000 each to $10,000 each, that's a huge increase percentage wise and it represents a validation of the, an external validation of the, the kind of impact and interest in the work. So there was a kind of, of mindset like that that we came across a few, a few times. Um, so, you know, I think the other way that the humanists factored in, Oya spoke about this already, was in terms of the richness of these interdisciplinary programs and teams that some of um, the senior research officers were trying to foster on particular projects. And so it's not just humanists. I mean, it could be legal scholars, it could be uh, social scientists and others, but the idea of bringing together, you know, an ethics perspective on the biological uh, area, you know, biomedical area of, of interest or, or what have you. There was a sense that there are ways that humanists can and should contribute to and support that work. And I think that was one of the, one of the bits that came up probably more, more frequently than anything else in terms of how we heard about, about humanists. Um, Clifford, your observation about the service role, I think, is or service model is such an important one. Of those, of, of those senior research officers, almost every single one of them was a, um, was a scientist. Now, not all of them were necessarily a lab scientist. There could be, you know, field, field researchers or observational researchers of one sort or another. There was one notable exception who was a law professor. Um, and I think that may have been the only senior research officer of what it, of service or professional model who was not a, um, a scientist by training at least. And, um, and in that particular case, the individual brought to bear some pretty extensive um, policy and um, sort of uh, legal interests that were germane to um, to the senior research officer role, so it wasn't as surprising of a uh, of, of a sort of you know intellectual property and knowledge transfer and things things of that sort. So, uh, let me stop there, and um, Oya or Jane may may, have, may wish to add to that. Uh, just just one point to add. In every conversation we had, this whole issue of interdisciplinary importance of interdisciplinary uh, research was highlighted, and. Um, always mentioned was uh, scientists working with humanists, social scientists, and actually they very often listed uh, professional programs, whether it's law, social work, school of management, so on and so forth. But something we really did not check was whether this whole interdisciplinary thing was more aspirational as vision or how much they were able to put it in practice. But they very often mentioned about uh, kind of structural, 
not necessarily barriers, but impediments uh, in means of kind of bringing individuals together and, uh, you know, and uh, motivating them uh, to work together. And again, I think Roger already made this point, but uh, there were several mentions to, uh, uh, you know, in, com in comparison to science, uh, the funding sources for humanities not being robust and Again, that's one of the reasons they are trying to diversify from, you know, getting funds from alumni or from foundations, so on and so forth. I think it definitely, uh, I'm really happy to hear kind of this research enterprise uh, definition, uh, you know, being kind of formed beyond the science, although the science is at the center because of uh, the revenues it generates or sometimes its impact, especially with uh, health, so on and so forth. Thanks, that's really illuminating. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it, we do have a few more questions here in the queue, so let me just get right in there. The first one is, um, could you give a better sense of the context when the library was mentioned by SROs? Uh, sure, uh, let me perhaps start and then I'll turn it over to Roger and Jane. Uh, I mean, as you know, SNR, we work very closely with libraries and uh, I spent more than 20 years of my life in the library. So we, we know when we enter these conversations, we really want to understand the big picture, but we were really uh, trying to also understand the space vis-a-vis -vis libraries. So very, very specifically, in at least two questions, we asked about libraries, libraries role. So that was really the context. The, the first big one was, uh, research support and that we as I said that was the big question to start the conversation and then we used probes we said you know how about the library how is the library working and the second one was uh, uh, research data and research information management systems again we did ask uh, uh, as I said you know Roger and I in these interviews were very much interested in understanding implications for uh, various service providers that are really aiming to uh, support the research enterprise. So library was very important for us, at least understanding. I hope I answered the question. Roger, anything to add or Jane? I think that's perfect. I think, um, thank you, Oya. And thank you for the question. And um, Roger just pointed out to me, there was a there is kind of a related question here that I think would be fine to go ahead and um, follow up on um, on that last question from Sarah Pritchard, who, um, who asks, did any of your VPR interviewees seem to get that libraries themselves meet all the definitions of core facilities and library funding should be worried about um, in exactly the same way? And then she comments, too often on campus, we're not clustered to advocate in that way. And I'm not talking about how overhead rate is split up. Would you like to comment on that? So perhaps I'll um, try to speak to that. So um, the simple answer is no, I don't think that the typical senior research officer that we spoke to uh, gets that, even though of course we, and that was the reason why we phrased the question the way that, the way that we did as, as I pointed out. Um, I would say that the single exception, which I, I think may be of interest to some of the library directors um, in particular, um, maybe not the single exception, one of the very, very few exceptions um, was a senior research officer, a VP of research to whom the library reported. So as, as many of the people in the CNI community will realize, there tends to be a preference among library directors to report directly to the provost, whether as a vice provost for libraries themselves, associate provost for libraries, or as a as a dean of libraries, right? That tends to be a, a seen is seen as a kind of um, signal of the kind of um, importance that's given to the to the library. But in fact, the one case where the senior research officer seemed to really really get um, some of the strategic things that were going on in the library was a case where that senior research officer had the library as part of their reporting responsibility. So I don't say that to you know, argue with anybody's perspective on anything. I just thought it was very, very interesting. 
Um, I think this raises a really important question, though, which is what are the things that libraries can do um, to build greater alignment with, you know, with the senior research officer and a greater sense of, um, of, of sort of shared purpose. And, um, and so we're actually one of the things that we're thinking of, of doing is organizing a kind of cohort of research library directors who might be interested in exploring that, that question further. So um, happy to talk to anybody offline who might be interested in pursuing that. Uh, that that was really interesting and a great question, Sarah. Thank you for raising that. Thanks for addressing it, Roger. Um, another question now: Was there any consideration of working in the various open environments, open source, open access, open data? Uh, perhaps this is anecdotal, not a generalization. But as someone who is really interested in preprints, this kind of stuck stuck with me. Uh, one of the interviewees uh, mentioned that um, their faculty now uh, has increasing interest in using preprints. And he mentioned that maybe it was a recent meeting or they were discussing preprints. And it was very interesting because he was thinking about uh, reputation building and institutional reputation and risk. Uh, so it was, I mean, obviously this person would course be excited about openness, but his mind was really thinking about what does it mean for my university? How would early sharing of uh, research going to affect my, uh, my university's uh, reputation or are there any risks involved? So it's just an anecdotal, but uh, there were definite, they are definitely watching this space. And I think I tried to articulate it as I was talking about research data research data, public uh, access mandates. There is really great awareness among these um, senior research officers that it's really important to engage the publics and, uh, you know, and increase their confidence about research knowledge created and how it has an impact on real individuals. Mm -hmm. So they are very mindful, uh, but, but they were talking about how do we tell our story how do we unpack research so it's easier to understand? And yes, openness is important, but is that open information making sense? And is it really leading to better understanding? I thought that they were really much more thinking about impact, not openness for the sake of openness. Roger and Jane, you may have additions. I, I think that's really, really well said, Oya. And um, you know, the research data case just really, as as you've already spoken, just really made that clear that there were just so many factors on their landscape other than openness. It wasn't to say that they disagreed with it or had any, yeah. um, you know, ideological opposition to it, but there were just so many other factors at at play. And I think that's that's just really. So interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate that question as well. Um, I see that we're close to time here. So I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm going to actually shut down the recording, but invite any attendees who'd like to stay back. Um, our panelists have agreed to stay with us a little bit longer here for um, a chat, and we'd love to have you join us. Uh, so if you just raise your hand, I can turn on your microphone and you can join our chat. Um, and thank you again so much to our three panelists, Oya, Jane, Roger. It was wonderful having you here at CNI. We really appreciate um, your coming to share this work with us. And thank you so much to our attendees for making time with us. We hope we'll see you at our next uh, plenary where uh, Fran Burnham will receive the Paul Levin Peters Award. So hope to see you there. Bye-bye.